Mike Schneider podcast. All right, Gary Chin, nice to have you here on the podcast. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, um, for anybody listening who doesn't know who Gary Chin is, um, you probably haven't been fingerboarding for a while because he's one of the most well-known YouTube fingerboarders from the early days, I would say, and definitely a big inspiration to a lot of fingerboarders, especially your tutorials and stuff like that. So, yeah, you've actually been like the most requested guest, I think, one of definitely. So, yeah, it's good to have you. Yeah, that's an honor. Um, it's amazing. People ask me how long I've been fingerboarding, and I really don't even know. It's like, I think I started in 2005, 2006 cool. or so. And um, yeah, I pretty much started filming videos and fingerboarding at the same time because it's not like I was fingerboarding with people in person. I was creating videos and just sharing it with people online. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So uh, take us to the very beginning. So before you got into fingerboarding, just so we can get a little background on who Gary Chin is. Uh, where'd you grow up? What was your family like? And what kind of things did you do when you were younger? Yeah, so I grew up in Astoria, Queens, in New York City. Um, I'm the youngest of two brothers. Um, cool. Was me and my older brother. Um, and my family um, is Chinese, or they're Chinese immigrants. My mom is from Hong Kong. My dad was born in the United States, but both of my sets of grandparents are from, from China. Um, my main hobbies growing up really were riding my bike, which is related to my career now, and fingerboarding. Um, and fingerboarding kind of was the catalyst for a whole bunch of the other hobbies that I ended up getting into. But um, yeah, I feel like I grew up in New York City and everything was pretty accessible. There was always like a lot of diversity around and I used to see lots of like kindergartners and first graders and stuff like that in the lunchroom playing with tech decks. Whoa. And that was a memory that stuck with me and I didn't end up fingerboarding until much like later in my life. I mean, it wasn't late, but um, I didn't actually like buy my own tech deck or have access to a tech deck for a long time, but I always thought it was cool. That was like the toy that people would bring to the lunchroom. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I don't think I saw them till like fourth grade. So you had kids that were like really young that had them in your school. Yeah. I, I think cool. I always liked as a child um, building things. Um, Tinker toys were like my favorite as a little kid. Um, I liked Lincoln logs and there was something about like tech decks. It was, there was something cool about that. I grew up around computers a lot too. And there was this website I don't even remember what it was, but there was like a parody of like fingerboarders before it was cool. <laughs> and you may know the video I'm talking about. I don't know. But I think the, the guy's name was Matt and he's like, oh, I'm a professional fingerboarder and I'm from Texas. And like, he, oh, that rings a bell. Yeah. What, what happens after that? Or like, what's, I what's think he, the... he starts doing like just ollies and kickflips and stuff, and then there's some other fingerboarders too. Is it Matt Johnson? Matt Johnson, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. It. Yeah. And Old he's, video think, from Tech Deck from like when they first came out. Yeah, and he was the one who did the original Tech Deck tutorials. Mm -hmm. um, but I just remember seeing kids with Tech Decks in the cafeteria and like watching those videos, like maybe, I don't know, like second, third grade or whatever. And yeah. I didn't have a tech deck of my own, but I was always like, that's kind of cool, like, <laughs> that this exists. Yeah. Cool. I know you asked so. about my childhood, but, like, I don't know, it's like, toys were a big part of it, and mm -hmm. fingerboards or tech decks at the time were the toy that I saw and was like, wow, that's really neat. Yeah, that's sweet. So then at what point did you actually get your own and start doing it? Because yeah. you were introduced to it before, and then it kind of marinated for a while in your head, or what? Yeah, it was sixth grade, and I remember it was the sixth grade because it was that year that I asked my father for an allowance, <laughs> and um, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in an immigrant family, and we didn't really have much money or means, like even when we took vacations, we would ride our bikes everywhere, and my parents didn't give me like an allowance of any kind, and I remember my dad was like in the bathroom 
washing his hands and I like went up to him like dad can I ask you something and he's like yeah I hang around other kids in middle school and they say that they have this thing called an allowance and that's where they get like a certain amount of money every week and like you could tell my dad like knew where I was going with this you know? yeah and I was like you know even if it's just like a couple dollars a week like I could like save it or I can like use it on things that like I want to buy and like practice like saving money and you know my dad's like all right like why don't we start with like five dollars a week or something and I remember one of the first things I did was I saved up enough money to go to the Toys R Us in Times Square after school and buy a tech deck. That's awesome. I bought um it was a tech deck and a blind skateboards like um or it was a it was a blind graphic and it was a spine um spine ramp so oh yeah yeah that one was fun and the I reason like why one. i picked it was because um <coughs> well i didn't want to just like pop the board on flat i wanted to have a ramp but yeah. i knew that popping the board might be difficult because i had saw those old videos and i was like maybe it'd be a good start for me to do vert where i don't have to pop the board and i could like just flick it off the ramp and uh practice like vert fingerboarding yeah that's sweet yeah that's so awesome when i was little i didn't even know what an allowance was yeah <laughs> like i don't even know uh i would like hear kids talking about it and i didn't know what they were talking about so i just like ignored it <laughs> but yeah that's super cool so it's strange like when you asked me that question it, it, it was so clear to me what i wanted to do with my allowance i didn't yeah i didn't even spend it i just I feel like I saved a whole bunch and I just bought a tech deck <laughs> with a spine ramp. And then after that, I bought um, another tech deck that had like the shotgun rail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Do you still have those today? Um, yeah, they're in storage at my parents' place. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's sweet. So then you started fingerboarding uh, with the tech deck and the ramps that you got and how did that go? Like, were you just messing around or did you get good really fast or what was the progression like? Yeah. Um, I had, I had remembered the old tutorials from the tech deck website and I remembered them being somewhat helpful, but the most helpful tip that I got from it was, um, to put the board on the side of your leg. Mm -hmm. And then you can flip the board upside down and up and over like that. And I remember doing that on my leg and also using the spine ramp and like putting the board upside down. Yeah. Um, at first I was fingerboarding with three fingers. And, Me too. <laughs> yeah. And um, the next big thing that I did with my allowance money was to buy a webcam. Nice. And I used that webcam to record videos and put them up on the Tech Deck forums. And um, we used a website called Put File. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. And I would just do some tricks and I would upload it to Put File on Tech Deck forums and most of them didn't get seen, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I did get like some comments and they were like, oh, you know, three fingers, you know, you should try using two fingers. And like I eventually tried doing two fingers. Um, so the progression was like pretty slow, but I feel like I remember being realistic about what I could do. I was never into re unrealistic tricks. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know what it's called when you just pop the board and it, uh, flips like randomly or it flips like, like a, a crescent moon or whatever and then you <laughs> put your fingers back on it. But like, I knew that wasn't actually a skateboard trick. Yeah. Um, I was into... I played like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and I watched like some skateboarding videos. Um, so I wanted to do the tricks that were actually like possible on a skateboard. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, were you skateboarding too at that point or? I was not. I think started fingerboarding before I started skateboarding. Cool. I think I was more interested in the tricks themselves than yeah. like, you know, doing it for real as people um, like to say online, like do it on a real skateboard. <laughs> yeah. You know, we can get more into that later. Sure. But um, 
I started skateboarding a little bit afterward, but I knew that my parents would have some hesitation with me skateboarding because it was like dangerous or yeah. riskier. And fingerboarding, what are they gonna say? Like, it's it's a it's a toy in their in their mind, and there aren't as many risks associated with it. Yeah, totally. Did your parents ever get annoyed with you fingerboarding? The noise or anything? No. Um, cool. I think <coughs> my parents have always been really supportive of my fingerboarding and anything that I do in life. Mm-hmm. Um, it, this kind of goes back to the allowance thing too. Maybe, I don't know where I learned it. Maybe, maybe my parents are just really good role models or I had good mentors in school. But how I framed that allowance thing, it was like, Dad, I want an allowance so I could budget and so I could save money and so I don't have to just ask you for when I want to buy something, I actually have to save it in order to buy it. It was similar with fingerboarding. Like, yeah, my mom at first was like, what's the point of this fingerboarding stuff? And I was like, look, I'm learning how to make videos. I'm talking to people online. And like my hand and eye coordination is like (laughs) through the roof now. Like look how fast I can type. And I don't think it's a coincidence that I could type so fast and fingerboard well, you know? Was there really a correlation there? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was just tangential, but um, the skills are transferable. And I think like fingerboarding is much more than what it is on the surface. Yeah, totally. It definitely kind of spills over to all these different things in life and, you know, little skills we pick up or like attention to detail that other kids might not develop so early and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're making videos, you're starting, you know, to get more control, use two fingers rather than three. And then uh, when did, or actually I want to ask where the name Weak Fingers came from, because I was going to ask when, when the YouTube stuff started, but yeah, how'd that name come up also? Yeah, <laughs> um, so it's a funny story and I actually don't really remember how I got to Weak Fingers. But I do remember the first time I became popular and one of my videos got featured on the Tech Deck homepage, Ooh. which was like the thing. Like yeah. If you had a video that was featured on techdeck.com, you know, that was like big news. Yeah. And I made a parody fingerboard video where, you know, G.I. Joe dolls? Yeah. I had boots from a G.I. Joe. And I had video, like, I made a video of me using the boots with my fingers and, like, bailing and crashing into stuff. (laughs) And that got featured on TechDeck.com. So all of a sudden, people thought it was really funny, and they started following me. And I think because I started bailing into stuff on the video, I was just like, oh, yeah, weak fingers. I didn't want to use my name, and I didn't want to use something that was, like, too cheesy so <laughs> i don't know weak fingers is kind of cheesy i guess but um yeah i didn't i guess it's kind of tongue-in-cheek too right i didn't want to be um like overconfident or whatever i didn't want to say like what's the opposite of that strong like strong fingers, fingers yeah like, yeah or like best uh <laughs> best finger border ever you know like it was kind of funny just to say like oh yeah weak fingers yeah, yeah. that's awesome yeah. <laughs> love it um so yeah a lot of people know you for your tutorials like how to kick flip and stuff like that and uh what made you decide to make those when did you realize like okay i'm good enough that i can teach someone else how to do this now yeah so i think the best one of the best ways to solidify your learning is to teach something because you can't teach something unless you've mastered it right And tutorials and in the skateboard world, we call them trick tips. Trick tips were very like formulaic, but they weren't really that helpful. And this was, this is kind of a breakdown of how trick tips used to be, right? And a lot of them might still be. Hey, today we're going to learn how to do a kickflip. All right. To do a kickflip, put your fingers here, pop the board, flick your finger off the edge of the board, watch it flip put your fingers back yeah. on it and roll away. There you go. You learned how to do a kickflip. Yeah. <laughs> now that you know how to do a kickflip, try doing it into combos. And it's like, wait a second. Like, you just skipped over so many steps. All the details. All the details yeah. that 
<laughs> are vital to the learning process, right? And um, one of the videos that um, teach that helped me learn how to ollie, like I said, was putting the board on the side of your leg, going upside down, and then going like that. Yeah. The next step was like a big jump, and I remember it like not being progressive enough. Um, in the video, they said, imagine there's a ball in the middle of the table, and your goal is to pop the board and ollie over that ball. And I was like, wait a second, I went from not popping the board and rolling off the side of my leg, going upside down like that, to now popping the board and going over a ball. Like, that was a huge jump. Yeah. So, in my mind, teaching helped me learn it better, right? And the first trick tip that I created, I believe, was a pretty advanced trick. It was the kickflip backside tail slide uh, trick tip. Cool. And that video was, was pretty popular, but... The next trip, trick tip that I created was the kickflip trick tip. And I think to date that might have like two and a half, three million views or something like that. But that's by far my, my most popular YouTube video. And that's where I said everybody loves kickflips. <laughs> and I had no idea that that was going to blow up. Right? <laughs> I was just like, everybody loves kickflips. Of course we're going to learn kickflips. Yeah. But um, the teaching method... To me, I mean, I was just a teenager, so I wasn't like, I need to make a lesson plan. I need to be better than other people when I create trick tips. But like I said, you need to have a process and you need to teach people about the process. And in my mind, it was, okay, what do you need to know before you try to learn how to do a kickflip? If you can't ollie, then you shouldn't be learning how to do a kickflip. Right? Yeah. If you can't pop the board, you shouldn't be learning how to ollie. Like, so there are different steps that you, prerequisites, we'll say, that you need to fulfill in order to move on to the next, advance to the next stage. So for kickflips, it was learn how to ollie, and you should be able to actually do it on a flat surface, right? And then the next step was finger positioning. I feel like most trick tips were good about that. Like, put your fingers here. But everybody's a little different. So um, you want to make sure that you include like a couple close-up angles of where you should put your fingers. And I remember moving, well, I, didn't, I don't think I even moved the camera. I moved like my hand and I was like, here's from the front, here's from the side where you put your fingers. Mm -hmm. um, I made sure I put a slow motion clip of me demonstrating the kickflip. And I went through all the steps, which is what a lot of trick tips do. Pop the board, slide your finger off this edge. Um, and then um, you could do the trick tip or you could do the kickflip. Um, I remember one thing in the video that I mentioned that was helpful for me, but I didn't see mentioned in any other trick tip was people always say, curl your finger or flick your finger off the edge of that's closest toward you to make the board flip. For someone who doesn't have board control at that level, who hasn't been fingerboarding for a long time, do you think they have the like muscle memory and the the control to be able to like curl their finger and flick it off the edge? No. Um, so what I said was, if you have trouble flicking off the edge, you can try turning your hand and rotating it. Because effectively, if you're rotating, mm. your finger is going off the edge the same way as yeah. if you were to independently flick this that's finger. cool and that's like the that's an example of two different styles kind of like that's going to develop into your style depending how you do it right so over time your kickflip is going to become more controlled in that you can pop and independently flick this finger and cause it to flip but in the beginning you don't have that kind of development so you pop and then you could kind of just turn your whole hand and it'll flip because you know as an instructor if someone's able to pop the board and just kind of flick their hand violently and get the board <laughs> to flip toward them, that's a huge win because now the board is doing something that you intended it to do. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I'll go back to that, the whole process. Um, so yes, you want to go through step by step what 
they should be doing. But obviously there's going to be roadblocks along the way, right? So you want to troubleshoot. And I think that was the next section that I um, wanted to put into my trick tips or tutorials. It was, if things aren't going your way, what should you look for and how do you correct that? So if the board is under flipping, maybe you're not rotating your hand enough or you're not flicking off the edge. Maybe it's flipping the opposite direction. So you're doing like a heel flip or something. Um, maybe it's flipping too fast. You know, you want to slow it down. Um, so you, you want to mention that so that people can like course correct or self correct and then make progress. And then at the end, try to give a couple different like demonstrations and like, oh yeah, now that you learned it, here's what you can try learning next. Um, so yeah, I think that started it all. It was the kickflip trick tip and I published it and people were like, whoa, this is the best trick tip that I've seen. Like, thanks, you taught me how to do kickflips. And I guess I wanted to continue teaching people. I thought it was really nice to be able to like share this knowledge with others. Yeah, I think you have a special gift at doing that because I was trying to teach my dad how to fingerboard like for years. I'd always be doing it at the dinner table and stuff and he's always like trying it and he couldn't get the thing off the ground at all. And then <laughs> I tried like telling him different things or whatever, but he couldn't do it. And then he watched one of your videos and then the next day he's like popping it and like getting it in the air and like doing like three shows and stuff. <laughs> and he's like, oh, Gary Chin taught me. And I'm like, wow, yeah. okay. So I think you have a different approach to analyzing it and then teaching it based on how you're viewing it because for me, I have a lot of trouble teaching something that I can do because for whatever reason, it's like I figured out and then it just becomes natural and then I forget what I'm doing almost like it's so much muscle memory that I have trouble like stepping back and like breaking it down in the way that you do. So it's really cool that you're able to do that like that. Yeah, thank you. I think I remember it was the last store, se store session I was at and your dad was like, you're the one who taught me how to ollie. It was really <laughs> funny. Um, so yeah, cool. It's really just like taking a step back and like putting yourself in that position like remember when you were a beginner and like paying attention to like all the subtle things that could be going wrong and that could be improved and as a student as the person actually learning the trick you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again you have to like mm -hmm. really like what did what does it feel like what's happening to the board and like how can i correct yeah, yeah. very cool um, what was the first time you saw somebody fingerboarding in person? Was that when you went to rendezvous? The first time I saw someone fingerboarding in like, person. Like actually doing actually tricks, doing not tricks. just like in elementary school. Yeah, it was in the driveway of your, uh, your old house, <laughs> your parents' house. Yeah. Um, was that rendezvous three or four? Yeah, I think it was three, but we'll check on YouTube later. Three yeah. or four. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find the rendezvous and what was it like going to that? Oh, it was it was amazing and it it was pretty incredible that there was there were other people that were excited about fingerboarding and like they all came from all over the country to fingerboard. And um I had fingerboarded with people in person before, but that's because I introduced them to it and mm -hmm. I taught them like, hey, I don't want to do this by myself, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. If you find this cool, like I'll teach you how to fingerboard. But Rendezvous was the first time that like I ever used like a Black River ramp. It was the first time that I saw people who I had been talking to for years and I finally had the chance and opportunity to meet them. Yeah. Um, I remember asking my parents about it. I was like, oh, it's in Massachusetts, you know, could we drive out there? And they were like, yeah, we can like drop you off there and then we'll spend some time, um, you know, with family that lives in the Boston area. And then when you're done, we'll pick you up. Cool. And the time flew by. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That is the first time I met you. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I still remember the footage, like, from way back then. Yeah. I think the main hesitation, um, you know, I think nowadays it's a different culture, but I don't know. I, I don't want to say that people are more relaxed about, like, meeting up people online, but, like, 
back in the day, it was like you you didn't you didn't have like FaceTime and like yeah. so many videos and like sometimes you only saw people's fingers in the fingerboard because right. you don't even know what they look like. So convincing your parents to drive you out of state to some <laughs> fingerboard event, it's like kind of scary, I guess. But um, I remember like telling my parents like yeah you can like literally pull up there and see like what's going on like as soon as they pulled up and they saw a bunch of ramps in the driveway and a bunch of teenagers and kids that were younger than me they were like oh yeah this is completely fine yeah yeah Yeah, definitely back then the internet was like not as developed as it was now like there was very few videos even compared to like your parents can't just like look up the event and be like, oh yeah, that's an event. There's been 30 of them already. It's like, oh, this is like, like you found this on a message board. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, it's like, oh, yeah. it's this cryptic message on techdeck.com <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> different, different world. Yeah. But yeah, that was awesome. So we probably met in like what, 2007, eight ish. Yeah. Maybe? I think, I think it was 2007, 2008. Um, Yeah, because that was right around the time that I used my first ever um, board with rip tape on it with foam. Whoa, yeah, cool. Soft tape. And I had purchased that board from you. It was a Berlin wood with like a sunburst kind of plies on it. Oh, the red one with yeah. like the yellow. Do yeah. you still have that? No, I ended up uh, giving it to a friend in high school who really Whoa. liked it. Yeah. Um, but... I remember you used that video, uh, you used that deck in um, a video that you put up. It was like a a planter or like a bench. Oh, yeah, video. it was that board. Okay, yeah. 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 And I was like, that board's awesome. And then once it was for sale, I was like, that's the board I saw in the video. <laughs> and honestly, I was less interested in the deck. I was more interested in the tape. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I can kind of knock, knock two things out at once. Yeah. Um, because at that point, I had only ever used um, grip tape and, like, U.S. made boards. I knew that, like, Berlin Wood was the top of the top. Totally. Yeah, and back then, it was really hard to get both of those. Rip tape and Berlin Woods yeah. was, like, there wasn't a lot of them. You couldn't just order them, really, on a website. You kind of had to find someone that got some or, like, get lucky on the Internet with a trade or something. So, yeah, that, that was a big deal getting that stuff back then. And now it's, like, people, there's so many of them, it's, like, not a big deal at all. It's so easy to get. Yeah, there was, like, a buy and buy, sell, trade, like, yeah. section of um, FFI, Finger Flip Inc., mm-hmm. where people would say, like, I have five packs of rip tape. <laughs> like, if you want them, like, let me know. And they'd be gone within minutes. Like, yeah. so that's why I was, like, <laughs> You're selling used, like a used deck with rip tape on it that's like worn out. Yeah, I want it because <laughs> I want to try out rip tape, you know. And there was a stigma around using uh, rip tape because you have like purists who are like, oh, like rip tape is cheating. And, you know, <laughs> I don't want I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit hole, but I'm, I'll just say that nowadays the culture is um, definitely more open to like innovation and trying new things and, um, doing what's going to enhance performance on a fingerboard. Yeah, totally. I think now it's all about that. And back then it was, it was a little of everything. It depends kind of who you were talking to, but yeah. Um, that's funny you mentioned that because I haven't really thought of that in years, like how there would actually be some people that were like against using rip tape. Yeah. That's crazy because now it's the standard, like foam tape is on every single board. It's like one in a thousand kids has grip tape on it or something like it's yeah. so rare i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of put myself out there and say this is my fingerboard hot take all right i think that there are skateboard purists who don't like to try new things in fingerboarding because it wouldn't be possible on a skateboard hmm. i think fingerboarding is fingerboarding skateboarding is skateboarding and i think they're very closely related but why shouldn't we be doing things that are impossible on a skateboard that are only possible on a fingerboard? Because that's the beauty of it, right? Like you can use foam tape because if you put it on a skateboard, it would last 10 minutes. (laughs) The the tape would get ripped up. But on a fingerboard, it's more comfortable. It's grippier. 
Um, so it makes more sense to do that, you know. Um, you know, on a on a fingerboard, it might be hard to do like a nine hundred or whatever because your arm can only rotate so much. Yeah, I, mean, I know people have done it, but <laughs> on a you know on a skateboard, you know you're actually it's hard on a skateboard too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, but it's doable. It's doable. So yeah, there's there's physics to fingerboarding and there's physics to skateboarding, and like the equivalent of like you doing a kickflip off of your kitchen counter to the to the floor is like you <laughs> jumping off of a rooftop. Right? Yeah. But why not do it on a fingerboard? It's it's fun and it's possible, and I think the the same the same um, thing is true for equipment. Like, um, really really high kicks might not be for everybody, but if you prefer that and it's on your fingerboard, why not try it? Yeah, definitely. I think with fingerboarding, you can just be as... Well, with both of them, you can be as creative as you want, but there's certain things that are, like, a little easier to do on a fingerboard. Like, if you... Oh, I was going to say going up handrails, but, like, people do that in skateboarding now, which is insane. Like, a lot of the things that we would get, kids would complain about, like, if we did, like, let's say, like, I don't know, crook nolly flip up a handrail on a fingerboard and they'd be like, oh, that's not realistic. Yeah. And now there's people doing that in skateboarding. So it's like, was it realistic all along? We just didn't know it yet that it would happen in the future. So, I mean, it's really like, it's up to you how you want a fingerboard, but you can do whatever you want, whether it's totally realistic or totally unrealistic or anything in between. Right. Just what you go think, for it. What you think is unrealistic now might be realistic 20 years in the yeah. future you know because people are always going to push boundaries they're going to they're going to innovate they're going to get better and you know things will continue to improve and that's not to say that we shouldn't respect the roots of fingerboarding we shouldn't respect like the culture of skateboarding i'm not saying that at all right? yeah um but I do think that we should also acknowledge that like fingerboarding and skateboarding are very related, but they're separate things. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool. Um, where else has fingerboarding taken you like past rendezvous? Like what other places have you gone to events at? And then, yeah, I mean, let's start there. Yeah. In terms of events, I met up with um, Alex McMillan in Texas, I think Whoa. maybe a year after I had met you at Rendezvous. Sick. And Did you just go there to meet him? We, we had planned on driving to Colorado to see my family. And instead of just going from A to B and then B to A, we wanted to do like a loop. Cool. And... I was like, how far is Texas from Colorado? <laughs> and I'm like, it's kind of out of the way, but honestly, we've never been to Texas, so why not, you know? Awesome. And they knew I had been talking to Alex for a while, and um, I always, like, looked up to him, and we were good friends at that point. And we ended up just meeting up in fingerboarding, and um, that was, like, one of the best experiences ever. It was so cool. Wow. Yeah. And then... Um, in terms of events, I've been to your events, obviously, but there was um, there was a moment in 2012 that I took fingerboarding pretty seriously again when I was in college. Um, this was, I believe, my junior year of college and sophomore or junior year of college. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to really try and take this like professional fingerboard thing to the next level. I want to see if that's possible, right? And um, I ended up going to Fast Fingers in Germany that year. That was the only time that I went to Germany. And that was an incredible experience. I'll save all the details for the next segment or something. What next segment? Oh, go yeah, for I guess it right I'll now. Go for it now, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, it was amazing. Um, like, I remember flying into Frankfurt and I was flying by myself. I had like this phone that had like prepaid minutes on it <laughs> and like emergency contact info. And I had asked like people like, where do I need to go? And like, how do I get there? And I knew it was fly to Frankfurt and then take the connecting flight from Frankfurt to Munich and then take a like local train from Munich to Schwarzenbach, which is 
Black River City or, yeah. you know, pretty much like fingerboard utopia of <laughs> Europe, right? Or the world, maybe. Um, but I remember like 80% of the people in Frankfurt spoke English and they could help me. And then I got to Munich and it was maybe like 50% of people spoke English. And then by the time I got to Schwarzenbach, the only people that spoke English were fingerboarders. Yeah, pretty know? much. Yeah. So the fact that I was like this Chinese male from America in the small like town in Germany was like unreal to me. Um, but the coolest thing about it was like it's a small town in terms of like on the map global population. But there was such a concentration of fingerboarders there, four fast fingers, that everybody knew each other. And it yeah. felt like, um, I mean, I think you were there too. Like, mm -hmm. it was like being a celebrity, you know? <laughs> I remember people coming up to me and they were like 14 years old. And they were like, Gary Chin, like I've been watching you for years. So that was just really, really amazing experience. Um, I think Fast Fingers was invite only or you had to apply to be accepted into the top 200 to participate in Fast Fingers, if I remember correctly. I don't even remember, but it could be. Or yeah. it could have been like, yeah, you had to sign up for the contest ahead of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember at the time I was sponsored by um, Flatface, Homewood, and uh, Y Trucks. And I remember being sent some product to sell as a fundraiser for me to go to Germany. Altogether, my expenses, this is cheap nowadays, but I remember altogether, it cost me about $1,200 for the flights, right? And all I remember thinking in my head was, this was invite only. I applied as a part of the top 200 fingerboarders in the world to do a run in the first division or heat of this contest. And it was a 30 second run on a park that no one was allowed to use until the day of the contest. <laughs> so it was like, I just spent $1,200 to do, to have 30 seconds to prove myself, right? And I remember months leading up to Fast Fingers, I would have a timer and I would set up ramps on a table and I would hit start and I would do my runs and I would practice and practice and practice. I got to Fast Fingers, obviously nerves were a thing. And this was the first yeah. time I was like fingerboarding on an international stage and um i had i had told you that this year i also put like expectations on myself where it was like let's see how far i can get as a professional fingerboarder right? <laughs> the top 30 runs of 200 would progress to the second round guess what place i got 31 31 <laughs> so i was one <laughs> i was one place out of progressing to the second heat and do you guess who got 30th and barely qualified? Me? No. It was the winner of that year, Valentin Leiber. Oh, no way. Yep. So Val That's crazy. Valentin Leiber squeaked in at 30. And then he won the whole thing. And won the whole contest. It could have been you. It could have been me. But, <laughs> but honestly, though, um, that's, that's just... It could have been me, but it, it truly could have been like, oh, yeah, my run could have easily ended at 30. But... Aside from the contest, like, that was such a fun experience. Mm -hmm. I remember, like, doing brick oven pizzas in the middle of the countryside. Yeah. Like, fingerboarding on, like, ramps that were, like, carved out of concrete in nature. It was just, like, a really nice way to get away and just, like, fingerboard. And I honestly felt, like, relieved after the, the contest was over. Um, Dimitri yeah. Schlotthauer was, like, known as, like, the most consistent fingerboarder at the time and, like, was playing skate with everybody. And I remember people wanted me to play skate with him. I got him to the letter A. And people were like, whoa, like you got three <laughs> letters, you know? I wish I could have beaten him, but um, didn't end up doing that. But yeah, uh, that was Fast Fingers. And then I um, flew back to the U.S. And then I went to Chicago for a Homewood event that was called uh, IFC, International Fingerboard Championship. Oh, yeah. And I ended up uh, winning that contest. There was, like a, there was like a Carlsbad um, Gap replica. And I think we had five tries to do like a run. And I don't know how I had the guts to do this run. 
but it was a figgy flip switch five o on a bench and then down the cross bad gap i did a switch tray and like i landed it really clean and then um i ended up winning the contest but cool fast fingers i think had like a cash prize and ifc was like donated product and i think like my winnings was like 200 dollars or something you know <laughs> so i ended up sitting down after that and i i wasn't really that serious about like can i make a living as a professional fingerboarder i just wanted to see like how far i could go but i sat yeah. down and i remember writing it down on a notepad i was like if i got first at fast fingers it would be like 5000 if I got first at IFC, which I did, that was like $200. <laughs> if I got first at, what's the next big contest? Like Battle at the Herricks, right? Yeah. Maybe. Okay, that's another couple thousand dollars. That doesn't even cover airfare or accommodations. <laughs> so I think fingerboarding as like you being a professional like contest fingerboarder, like to make a living off of, I don't think that's possible. It's possible if you're like monetizing your videos and you're making products and if you have companies. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I was ever under the illusion of being like paying for my lifestyle through fingerboarding. But um, I wanted to give myself that experience to truly call myself a pro fingerboarder. I think people like to say like, I'm sponsored now, I'm pro. But like really what does it mean to be a pro? And some people's definitions are you're sponsored to fingerboard. Some people's definitions are you're paid to fingerboard. Other people are fingerboarding supports your lifestyle. You can make a living fingerboarding. So I guess I wanted to explore what that definition was for myself. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. And then where did you kind of get to after that? I mean, you're like, okay, I'm not going to be like a, a celebrity contest winner, professionally paid actor, yeah. <laughs> but more of like, where you just like, okay, fingerboarding is more about blank. Like, what, what did it become for you after that? Yeah. Fingerboarding for me, I'm going to go back to the trick tips. Mm -hmm. Fingerboarding for me has always been about connecting with people, um, uh, giving people a hobby or allowing them to explore a hobby to connect with others and to teach each other a skill that isn't like, you can't just go up to somebody on the sidewalk and say like, can you teach me how to fingerboard? They'd be like, what even is that? Yeah. So like, I think fingerboarding allowed me to become a teacher and an educator of my peers. And it also allowed me to learn how to make videos. So I went to college for um, photography, film, and visual arts. And initially I wanted to do like Hollywood films, right? Like a lot of people who go into film school, they're like, oh yeah, I want to, be big in the film industry yeah and I realized that it wasn't really fulfilling because it was about the gear that you had it was about the people you knew and it was about like oh there's like this person with supermodel good looks and we're gonna make a film about them and it just felt really service level mm -hmm. so I ended up going more toward like the documentary film arena and I continued to like make trick tips. Even when I wasn't as active in fingerboarding, I still made trick tips because I knew people wanted to see those. And um, I really didn't know where I wanted to go with that when I was in college or about to graduate college. I just knew that fingerboarding was the main reason why I liked teaching people. And it was the main reason I got into film. Cool. Um, I got recruited by uh, Teach for America, which is um, a nonprofit organization that recruits like college graduates to um, teach in like underserved schools where there's teacher shortages, and they give them teacher training so that you know they can they can um, educate students in these school districts. Um, so it was kind of a jump from film to teaching, but when I when I think about what the bridge was between liking teaching and the documentary film and wanting to make a difference in people's lives, fingerboarding was that bridge. So yeah, it's like that's so cool. Amazing that I'm able to like step back nowadays and think I owe so much of who I am to fingerboarding. Yeah, I think fingerboarding really helps people 
discover their like the direction of their passion you know even if the passion is not going to be just fingerboarding it's like is it film is it teaching is it whatever and it's cool that it brought you to teaching because I feel like that's a less common path that it can take you there's so many paths that fingerboarding has taken like a ton of my friends and stuff so that's a really neat one yeah I've received messages from people on Facebook who follow like my weak fingers page and they're like you know I've watched your videos growing up and I want to let you know that you know I thought about taking my life because people were like making fun of me and like I never like had any friends but I started fingerboarding I started watching your videos and I started like meeting people online who fingerboarded and like you taught me so much of what I know and like now I feel better so like I want to thank you and oh, wow. that was the first time someone told me that and it made me realize like this is more than just about fingerboarding it's about connection and and like my parents I think I mentioned this earlier they never said you need to stop fingerboarding you're wasting your life doing this and maybe this could be a message to any like parent out there too if your child's into fingerboarding that might be one of the only things that brings them joy and it's more than just about fingerboarding don't be so hard on them and say like you're wasting your life fingerboarding because there's a lot of other things that they could be doing and that that could be their escape mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's extremely powerful wow yeah <laughs> unbelievable yeah it's like you never really know the impact of what you're doing until until somebody tells you basically but it's like i've had kind of similar stories from people once in a while and i'm always so surprised because they'll reference something that I was literally doing for fun and have it changed their life. And I'm like, that's so amazing. Like I'll, from my perspective, I was just having fun. I was doing what I wanted to do or whatever. It's like the music I chose and it brought them joy just finding about that music. So it's like just any little thing about what you do can really do so much more than you imagine it going and doing, you know? So yeah, as a teenager, I was making videos, I was fingerboarding. I didn't say like, I want to inspire people and like yeah. make it so that they change their life and you know, <laughs> write me nice messages on Facebook. You know, I never would have dreamed that this would have happened for me. Yeah, no um, way. But like, I'm so fortunate that I am in this position where I was able to and can still inspire people. Um, and I want to thank everybody because there are people who fingerboard and they don't have that kind of exposure. And, uh, I feel like when you make it, make it in your industry or your field or your hobby or whatever, there's a little bit of responsibility to like pass it forward. And um, I want to do my part. Yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. It's really well said. You mentioned that your fingerboarding tutorials and videos have helped kids through some pretty difficult times. Have you ever had any difficult times in your own life? Yes. <laughs> um, let me think about this. Could you could you target the question a little bit more? Like, I target I, you, Gary. Like no. In, in terms of <laughs> um, just like in my life or how fingerboarding got me through it. Or? Well, yeah. Have you ever had difficult, um, like a difficult time in your life, and then how did you get through it? And did fingerboarding have anything to do with that or not? Just in general. I mean, it can be any type of difficult period it could be when you were little or it could be last month yeah I've always been a high achiever in school and on the outside it always looked like I was doing fine and it always looked like I was progressing in my life and that everything was sunshine and rainbows right mm -hmm. but I felt like a lot of my friendships in high school were unfortunately uh, like superficial or like they didn't have much substance but not through my fault so um, like I said I was a high achiever and um, I think I had found out the end of my sophomore year of high school 
which was when I was really into fingerboarding, that I was the top of my class. I was going to be valedictorian if I continued um, keeping my grades up. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my friendships in high school like changed and it became really clicky because people who are really good friends with the salutatorian ended up like kind of changing the perception of me I hope they're not like listening to this like uh, we were all in high school so obviously it's it's different now you know I think we we would all respect each other but um, I was following my passions I was fingerboarding I was in the video production classes and I was into music so I was taking um, music classes and I was playing guitar and trumpet at the time and I did take a few of the um, AP classes but there was one teacher that their teaching style just clashed with me a lot and I struggled to learn from that teacher and I made a conscious decision to pull out of that class and to um, do something I enjoyed instead which was play in band so when you compound that, me pulling out of my physics class because I couldn't learn from this teacher, and me being on the track to be valedictorian, and people were um, kind of choosing between the valedictorian and the salutatorian, like which friend group are they going to be a part of, there was criticism. And that criticism was, you are deliberately choosing easy classes so that you could be valedictorian, which is not the truth. <laughs> I, I was just following my passion. Right. Right. And fingerboarding and making videos and continuing to do what I enjoyed, like follow my passion in life, like really helped me get through that. And my whole attitude in the situation was just watch me succeed. Whatever I put my head to I'm gonna try and make a difference and I just want to be a good person I don't want to cause drama I'm not intentionally choosing classes that make it so that I can be valedictorian you know I just enjoy giving everything a hundred percent I've I've done that with fingerboarding I've done that with everything in my life and um, like I said I, I doubt anybody from my old high school is watching this or listening to this. But if they are, I think we we can all take a step back and just be like, wow, that was really, really silly to, like, make those kinds of assumptions. And also for me to, like, um, I don't know, like, I took it, I, I, didn't, I never said anything about it, you know. I just kind of heard it and, like, let it build up inside of me. Mm. And fingerboarding was my way around that because if I couldn't, talk to my friends in high school, then, uh, you know, I would resort to talking to people online and just, like, share share my passions with people who actually cared about what I was doing over, like, people who were making assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, um, this isn't to say I had a bad high school experience. I really did have a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and they weren't, like, ever, like, overtly rude to me but I could tell that there was tension but I never neatly fit into any groups right there was the skateboard group after school and like while they were like out skating and like maybe they wanted to like go on like underage drink or something like that by by the waterfront like I would skate with them and then I would say all right I'm gonna go home so I can study or fingerboard or whatever so I never was 100% in the skater group um, I enjoyed like being active and I was always like in the gym and like lifting weights and stuff like that with the football crowd but like I obviously wasn't a football player right? yeah <laughs> um, I got along well with the people who um, were high performers in school um, but like I said there was that tension with the salutatorian situation um, so I didn't like a hundred percent fit in there so it was like I got along with everybody but just on the surface level mm -hmm. and fingerboarding allowed me to like have that deeper connection yeah um, and I guess nowadays um, everybody has difficult situations I think I've had um, challenges kind of 
navigating like situations in my career but it's always important to take a step back and to remember like what gives you purpose in life what brought me to where I am today and as I mentioned many times in this episode like fingerboarding was one of the things that inspired me to like branch off and like explore who I am as a person and it's it's such a simple thing um, on the surface but it really allowed me to connect and you can always just pick up a fingerboard when it's at the table and just do it for a couple minutes and it'll it'll remind you of like what are the important things in life just resetting and not not being too hard on yourself and, and remembering where you came from yeah, yeah that's amazing definitely do you have any advice for kids along that journey because I feel like when you're fingerboarding and when these things are happening, you know, when you're younger and stuff, you don't feel in the moment like this is changing my life. It doesn't feel so profound. And now it's like when you reflect on it, it was very profound and it connected all these things in different ways and it helped you through different situations and probably gave you certain mindsets. But I think, at least for me, when I was younger, it just literally felt like I was fingerboarding and that's it. Like there's no thought almost into any of these things. It's like, you don't think of like, Oh, I'm not getting along with people. So I'll go fingerboard. It's right. like, you just, you have, you're not getting along with people and then you go home and then you fingerboard. And like, you don't even necessarily realize like how they play together and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, what would you say to, a younger kid maybe in middle school or high school who might find themselves in a similar situation I would say keep fingerboarding and if it makes you happy and it gives you purpose well like you said I don't think anybody fingerboarding says like this gives me purpose right like but you do say this makes me happy I enjoy fingerboarding and I think you need to just trust that there's nothing wrong with you being a fingerboarder. I felt and mm -hmm. carried that guilt as a teenager and it was like there's always negative comments out there and, and there still are. In the days of Instagram and TikTok, it's, people can say whatever they want from across the world to put you down. <laughs> They might say, you know, get a life, like do it on a real skateboard, like this, you know, you're wasting your time and like you, you don't have any friends, right? Don't listen to those people, right? Because I've always been pretty good at like blocking it out because I had like pretty good like self-confidence, but there's nothing wrong with you fingerboarding. Keep doing it and don't be afraid to like branch out and like think about what do you enjoy um, in fingerboarding and what has fingerboarding led you to that you might be interested in. For me it was photography and film. For me it was like teaching people how to fingerboard. For some people it's you know making fingerboards and then you create a company called Flatface you know. Like, <laughs> um, I think you should be open to exploring like where fingerboarding will take you. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get there if you carry this guilt with you. And don't listen to the people that say, like, you know, you have no life for fingerboarding and that you, there's something wrong with you for fingerboarding. Um, it's, um, you have to trust yourself and you have to trust the process. And um, fingerboarding is a beautiful thing. It's simple but it can bring you places and you might not know that now but there's going to be some some day maybe 10 years from now you're not fingerboarding anymore maybe you just fingerboarded for a year or you know six months or maybe you're really excited about fingerboarding right now and you're listening to this podcast you know i would assume that most people listening to this are people who take fingerboarding seriously even if you're not doing it years down the line I guarantee you, you will be able to take a step back as an adult or later in your life and just say, wow, like that was a nice period in my life. And here's how fingerboarding, you know, positively impacted my life. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with that.
How did you become confident enough that the negative comments didn't get to you? Gary Chin's confidence tips 101. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it helped that my father was like pretty, I don't know, my father owned a business in New York. He owned a hair salon and he's always been a very optimistic person and we really much adopt like the mindset of like kill them with kindness right so when people say like do it on a real board i'm like this is a real board it's a yeah. figure board you know <laughs> yeah make right. almost like a lighthearted joke out of it yeah instead of taking it super heavy personal yeah and i think you have to realize that when people make negative comments it's not a reflection of you and what you're doing it's a reflection on their insecurities mm -hmm. and it makes them feel better to put other people down for something that they enjoy and i hate to say this but it's like instead of being upset at someone for fingerboarding why don't you join me and like try it out or like at least be open-minded about like the things that exist out there um because I personally wouldn't put someone else down for something that they enjoyed. And um, fingerboarding allowed me to be more confident because I was under no illusion that like by fingerboarding, I would be like the most popular person in the world because like this is a in-demand hobby, right? Like <laughs> I feel like people who play like basketball or football or whatever, like mm -hmm. those are sports that are in the mainstream, right? Fingerboarding is like a niche activity. So I didn't you know, assume that this was going to bring me popularity. So even going into it, I knew that I was kind of counterculture. I knew that I was going against the grain a little bit and I had to prepare myself for those like negative comments. But for every negative comment, you're going to have at least one or more positive comments and stick to your circle. Those people that actually watch your content, or actually talk to you and fingerboard with you, those are the people that you should be surrounding yourself with, not the person who says, the types of mean comment and then you never hear from them again, yeah. you know? Um, my trick tips got popular, but they weren't always popular for good reasons. A lot of times people were like, I wanted to learn how to kickflip on a skateboard and this garbage came up, you know? So, um, all I have to say is thanks for the views, you know, yeah. <laughs> you ended up pumping me out, you know, regardless whether you had good intentions or not, I'm going to just take your comment as, you know, you, you, I hope that you find peace in your life, but you shouldn't put other people down. Yeah, yeah. totally. I think also something I've noticed when I was older, I've heard it when I was younger, but I didn't believe it was that when people kind of like put you down for something or whatever, they're like, they're reflecting something that they're lacking. So for example, if you're having fun and they don't like your way of having fun, it's like they're not having enough fun in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's their way of reacting to that rather than finding the fun. Maybe they're actually uncomfortable to do what they think is fun. And it might be something as stupid as fingerboarding, but like different, you know, like, and they're too afraid to do it. So they're going to bully you instead. Yeah. And it's like, but once you kind of realize that, like those comments just bounce off you because you're like that's a person that's a problem with that person not with me because we could be doing anything whether it's fingerboarding or you know something more mainstream or something less mainstream and it's like even if you go play football like some people hate football even though football is huge a lot of people love it you're never going to please everyone you might have a different ratio of how many people you please versus not but it doesn't matter at all because it's it's all garbage like just do what works for you and the right people will accept it exactly fingerboarding is a harmless activity right yeah. <laughs> like you're just doing tricks and enjoying yourself it's not like you're you know it's not like your hobby is like going to people's yards and like pulling up their plants you know <laughs> like that is literally yeah like, criminal as opposed to like where you're just having fun so yeah. like i don't know i i always had positive interactions with even skateboarders in my school mm -hmm. like they were skaters and guess what when they were injured or bored or inside they would come to me and be like yo let's fingerboard and like yeah. that's cool it's 
it's always like the insecure people that have something to say and rarely do they have rarely will they say it in person you know and like you said it's it's reflecting a lack that's in their life and my response is to just be kind either ignore it or be kind and invite them and say hey fingerboarding is actually not that bad maybe you should try it sometime you know yeah what are they going to say to that i mean you know <laughs> they might just be like grumpy or whatever but <laughs> at least at least you didn't overreact and you're you're shining a positive light on yourself and fingerboarding totally know? And they'll probably leave you alone after that. If you give them a negative response, that's kind of what they want. They want to see that their negative comment made you angry or made you sad or whatever it is. And if you show that, they're going to do it again because it worked. It did what they wanted it to do. And it gave them the like, haha, I'm better than someone. Yay, I feel a little bit better about my situation, but in the, in the wrong way, you know. So if you don't show that type of a weakness, then they won't like pick on you, so to speak. Exactly. They'll see that you're not an easy target. They'll see that you're confident mm -hmm. and that you're, you're having fun and they're not. Maybe it'll, yeah. it'll allow, <laughs> allow it to sink in a little bit more. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but, I mean, we're laughing, but truly, it's like when someone makes a comment like that, it's, it's kind of sad, too, because it's mm -hmm. like, why is this person so angry and upset and, like, I just, I just hope that like they're able to not be so angry at the world and be productive, you know? Yeah. Because they might be doing some sort of hobby, and like they're I, secretly I fingerboarding at home. <laughs> yeah. They're filming crazy videos and not showing their face. Yeah. They're trying to put down <laughs> other people so they can become professional fingerboarders yeah. and, and collect that nice uh, check from fast fingers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's good stuff to to be aware of for sure, just how to handle those things. It it totally makes a difference because especially when you're younger, how you handle like little challenges like some kids not agreeing with what you're doing or whatever, how you handle it is going to change your path forward from there, you know? Are you going to like step back and hide from everyone because you're ashamed or are you going to do what you do and and not be ashamed of it and feel good about it and like be more open to you know conversations or showing it to people and then you know those are two very different paths so right. i mean i acknowledge this now I'm, I'm 31 years old i've been fingerboarding for you know decades at this point right yeah and um i say this now having a platform that like yes be confident you know um kind of kill them with kindness and realize that it's not like a reflection of you but if you're in that moment and you're just learning how to fingerboard and there's people that are like making fun of you for it like find some people that like who are responding to comments in a positive way but people who are being good role models and like try to mirror that behavior and like I think it's the responsibility of people like me and you who have been in the fingerboard industry or scene for a number of years to also like model that behavior right yeah um, if we were you know if you got like a angry um, if you had a, a dissatisfied customer you're not going to like Put the blame on them right you're gonna actually exercise good customer service skills and like people will see that and they'll see oh wow like mike is really professional and knows how to handle the business and to keep people satisfied and like make uh accept feedback and make modifications to product as necessary and that's the same thing with when you're like for me i, I was just a content creator if someone says something um that's critical I might say you know what that's a good suggestion I'll, yeah I'll look into that but like this isn't going to change because like this makes me happy or whatever and um it's important to like make sure that we are responding appropriately ourselves and we're we're demonstrating the behavior that we hope the youth who are learning how to fingerboard um also take up um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say that fingerboarding is something that always starts with youth, 
but I think we can all agree that like fingerboarding is primarily like a youth a hobby and then there are many youth who take it into adulthood mm -hmm. as opposed to people who start fingerboarding as adults but people who start fingerboarding as adults I give them a lot of credit too because that is like really awesome yeah it's so cool yeah 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 I love that I mean I figure like whatever whatever people see they're going to emulate like you know I think like our upbringing and our parents is like where we emulate the most like subconsciously kind of like stuff we learned that we don't even realize is like stuff we learned just ways of living but then after that as you get into hobbies and stuff like that it's like you have the people who you watch and whether it's pro skaters fingerboarders sports players like celebrities whatever it is that you're into it's like you're gonna take influence from the things they do positive and negative so it's like hopefully you got some people that are doing good things and and if you do have role models that do bad things you have to be smart enough to identify like what of that person do I not want to copy like if it's some celebrity and they do some something you don't like don't be like oh maybe it is cool because that guy did it and he's cool and be like no that guy's cool except for the one bad thing he does so like don't emulate that part right yeah I don't think it's good to put people on a pedestal because you know you can say I really respect and appreciate and acknowledge this person's accomplishments yeah but here is something that they did that I don't agree with or something that they could have handled differently and that's the critical thinking you mm -hmm. know and um, you know you never know who's watching I guess is is kind of like how you how you can put it and um, you mentioned people are always going to emulate the behavior that's around them and I would say you know if you're a parent and you have a child and you see someone doing an activity children are naturally curious they want to learn about the world so if they see someone fingerboarding then you know even just being like wow like that's really interesting what's that called like how are you doing that can I try and yeah like, that is the natural curiosity and that's how you can create someone create someone that's how you can build like critical thinking skills in like a child as opposed to oh like look they're not skateboarding for real you know like that's that's the exact opposite of like what right. you want to do yeah always go in with with curiosity and enthusiasm rather than negativity right cool well this is a perfect segue into another question I like to ask. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your life? All right. Um, okay. So I went to college for film and photography and I worked on a thesis film over the course of the four years that I was in college. Typically, it was a one-year project, but I knew exactly what I wanted my thesis film to be from day one. And that is because my grandmother suffered a stroke uh, the summer going into my freshman year of college. And she was left paralyzed on the left side of her body. So she was in a wheelchair, and she was living at home, and my father became the primary caregiver for her. Rather than putting her in a nursing home, we ended up... Uh, having my father be a part-time caregiver and he was working mostly full-time at the salon so it was a lot for him mm -hmm. I recognize this as a moment of vulnerability in the family and it started as I just want to capture my family's emotions and how they're getting through the situation and my family was handling it very well but I could tell it was taking a toll on my father. Fast forward, I filmed for three and a half years, and it was only a month before my senior film had to be finished. And my professor told me, you need to go back to New York City and film yourself with the family because I feel like something's really missing and that person is you. You need to put yourself into this film and really like tie things together. 
I went back to New York for the weekend to film and my grandfather, who was taking care of my grandma with my dad, suffered a stroke and passed away. And I ended up filming my grandfather's passing for the documentary. And that's not the mistake. It's almost amazing that I was able to be there as difficult as it was. Um, I remember there was a lot of emotion and I was creating this film and I had to travel back to New York for my grandfather's funeral and for the wake. And I ended up delivering um, a speech that was more about me than about my grandfather. It was more about the work that I put into the film and like the strength, I, I mentioned like the strength of the family, but I mentioned like the film and like my development and all the feelings of being a near college graduate. Like I am where I am today because of my grandfather. And like, that's how I phrased it. And I feel terrible even like hearing myself uh, say that now. It should have been about him. And instead I made it about myself, you know? And I've never had an issue with confidence. This kind of goes back to the previous thing we were talking about. I've always been very confident in myself, but that was a moment where like, I need to put the spotlight on other people and make it not about me. So, um, there were family members that were upset or put off by what I said. And I remember taking that feedback and, oh, I felt terrible. I apologized. And then I used it as an opportunity to make the film better, to uh, really like showcase the strength of the family and um, make changes in my life ultimately. But I still think about that today where you know, there was a moment where like, I just thought about myself and like how far I've come and like people around me like lifted me up so that I could get to where I am today. There's truth to that. But the real truth is that I have worked together with the people around me to get to where I am today. It's not that people have lifted me up and that I've like used people to get to where I am. So there's, there's a nuance and uh, that's a big life lesson. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, what's interesting as you were saying that I'm kind of thinking like in a way, even if you were talking about yourself, it's almost like a compliment to what he has helped you with in a way. Like maybe, you know, I, I didn't hear it. And like you said, people had comments and whatever, but the perspective that I, that I get from it is like, you know, there's probably truth to what you're saying that it was too much about you, but in the same way, it's like, it's like you in relation to him. So hopefully there's something there that kind of brings it together where I feel like, you know, he would have been proud, like, wow, I've helped him so much, you know, something like that. Yeah, emotions were high. I think, mm -hmm. you know, when a family member passes, um, people react differently. Yeah. So I think I definitely could have been more mindful, but at the same time, like my grandfather, one of my last moments that I remembered with him was I was waiting for this email to tell me that I was accepted as a teacher because I was about to graduate. And all of a sudden I got the email and I like stood up with my laptop and I'm like, I'm going to be a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and then my grandfather was also like, you're going to be a teacher? I'm like, I'm going to be a teacher in Indiana. He says, Indiana? I'm like yeah and then, like he gave me a big hug and that's amazing i was like that was a really cool experience so like yeah i know he'd be proud of me yeah but like in that moment and of the of the wake and the funeral i really should have like spoke to his accomplishments mm -hmm. because yes i'm a reflection of him but ultimately that moment was about him and i, I carry that into my life nowadays and how i can relate that to fingerboarding too is like yeah it might be like there was a point where like I was trying to be like the best fingerboarder in the world and like I was trying to put out more videos and I'm not gonna lie there was a point where I was like 
Mike Schneider is the number one most subscribed YouTube fingerboard channel, and I'm number two. And like, <laughs> I want to at least keep my number two spot, but like, how can I like get up there with Mike Schneider if not surpass his subscriptions? You know? Yeah. And like, I reflect on it now, and it's like, what a silly thing to think about, like, to focus on, like. We've always worked together. Like, we've always been friends. You sponsored me. I create videos for you. We always chat and bounce ideas off of each other. And that's the way it should be, you know? So, um, just think about the people around you. And, like, it takes a village to, yeah. to get you to where you are. And uh, don't ever forget the people along the way. Yep. Yeah, and it's not always about what you get out of a situation, whether it's attention from you know the people around you or whether like you said later sponsor i mean uh subscriber count like or money in your job or whatever it is like those types of goals are not what life is all about actually like it's really about so much more connections with people experiences growth as a person and helping others to grow and like all that kind of stuff is like that's the stuff worth bragging about, if anything. Not like, oh, I got more subscribers than the next guy or something. Like, I don't think of it as that way. Like, yeah. I think um, my my career nowadays is in nonprofit, so like I think a lot about like nonprofit things. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I like to remember is the best goals are not like the best goals are not target goals their growth goals mm -hmm. so like you don't want to say like i will be happy once i get to thirty thousand instagram followers yeah because you won't yeah. you won't be happy when that happens for more than five minutes exactly it's good it's fine to have those goals but what you should yeah. focus on is growth right i want to have more than i had last month or process goals i want to film at least five tricks a week so i can make this larger video and then you'll put that video out and then you will get more followers right because you mm -hmm. put time and effort and deliberation into creating something and like that's something we should always think about think about the process think about the people around you and don't just think about like subscriber count and follower count number of sponsors like how many boards can i get you know um it's not about the things or the numbers it's it starts with you yeah. yeah that's really good I feel like we almost touched on it but I do like to ask people their strengths and weaknesses so you can choose which one you want to do first oh, it's like a job interview yeah like biggest strength and biggest weakness yeah what is that the <laughs> greatest strength is that I care too <laughs> <laughs> um. I think someone else said that too <laughs> who said that was it Henry? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Somebody also said that, but like kind of as a joke. Yeah. Um, this definitely does feel kind of like a job interview answer. <laughs> but, well, but there's no job you're going to get from this. Or maybe somebody watching could be like, I need to hire that guy. He's amazing. Yeah. So, I'm in the nonprofit world. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, social impact sector. Um, but I would say my greatest strength is that. I'm extremely deliberate and strategic about things. Even when I talk about like trick tips, it's like, mm -hmm. it's personal, but it's formulaic, right? Even the way I think about that. What I mean by that is the formula is simple. Demonstrate the trick, demonstrate where you should put your fingers, demonstrate what each step of the process is, and um, illustrate what the the problems might be along and the roadblocks might be along the way and then provide context right the personal part of it is acknowledging like oh here's what some people might tell you or what here's what some people might do instinctually that you won't hear in a trick tip video like turning your body a certain way or like having the desk at a certain height or like um you know turning your arm rather than turning your hand like these are all things that make a difference in fingerboarding and i feel like 
because I always have like a process and a vision for things, I'm able to clearly articulate it and I'm able to create a good product. Um, I think I'm, I'm a high achiever in that way. Um, I don't do anything halfway, right? I'm always very thorough. Um, my greatest weakness is something I actually talked to my wife about uh, recently. And it's about me not being able to start things unless everything's completely in order. And um, in my mind, everything has to be organized. Everything has to be neat before I feel like I can take action on something. And if there's something that's out of place, I'll just freeze up. So in my personal life, what this looks like is I can't start cooking unless the kitchen's completely clean and everything's in the right place. If there's a dirty dish, I need to do that dirty dish first before I can start cooking mm. right? because I feel like things are in the way. Right? But professionally and with fingerboarding, it's like I try to be too perfect and I try to make I try to make sure that everything is figured out instead of just like rolling with it and uh, trusting that everything's going to be okay and that the process will work itself out. So I, I work on that a lot um, personally, professionally, and with my hobbies. And I know that in the end, you're going to make progress either way. You just have to like acknowledge that, yeah, the stage, the stage hasn't been completely set. And if you wait too long for everything to be perfect, you're never going to start. Mm, definitely. Yeah, there's certain times when I hear people being like, oh, I have this great idea, but like first I want to do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, maybe you don't need to do those things. Maybe it's time right now to go for the idea. You know, it's like, like you said, it's never going to be the absolute perfect time to do something unless it's as simple as cleaning the kitchen. But yeah. if it's anything more like... Sometimes you just have to kind of adapt to it and just just give it your best when it's almost, you know, the time's never going to be perfect, so it's good enough and let's go. Right. What, what do they say? Uh, perfect is the enemy of the good. Right? <laughs> you don't want to, like, freeze up and want everything to be perfect and end up doing nothing. Right. Um, yeah, you just have to take a step back. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me, too, of, like, sometimes... If there's something like we want to do and we don't quite know how to do it, it's like you could spend 10 years trying to learn how to do it or you could try to do it. And even if you fail, you already learned a lot and then you're closer to doing it than if you had waited all the time preparing and then it went differently than you thought anyways. So sometimes you just got to jump in and learn with the process. Yeah, I mean, flat face, how long has flat face been around? 20 years. 20 years, wow. So in... The formative years of flat face. It's not like you spent 10 years in a lab, like <laughs> perfecting boards until they were ready to be released to the public and you said, here's the finished product. If you did that... There would be no flat face. There would be no flat face, exactly, right? Yeah. You created boards that were, you know, by today's standards, they would be laughable, right? Yeah, the first ones for sure. Yeah. And if you never put those out into the world and received praise and criticism and feedback and mm -hmm. adapted for the next version of the product, you know, your company would fail. And you learn more from working with others and like hearing that feedback than you are from like testing it yourself and just holding it in. Yeah, so. which I see a lot of people doing people have really good products and they're like I don't think it's ready yet and then say that for years and they never launch it and it's like you should have launched that last week and the minor imperfections would if they bothered people you'll know it and if they don't you'll also know it because yeah. sometimes we're too critical you know like I could look at my setup and be like oh I could find something about this that could be better but if I gave it to 100 people and I said what could be better I bet you 96 of them won't say the same thing I said. They might say something different. They might say it's good as it is, whatever. Yeah. But it's like you can't get too caught up on things. Sometimes you just have to go for it and then. Yeah. I think nowadays the, the culture may have changed a bit where like people are used to kind of perfect products. Yeah. So, but as a business owner, 
you know, it might be important to say like, this is the first batch or you can yep. give it to people on the team and say, this is a test product. Like, tell me what you think. Like, let's, let's test it for like a month and then see how it works. Like, does it hold up? Does it perform well? And are there any durability issues? And then, you know, then you can release it, you know? So yeah, you don't want to be scared to like get feedback. Yeah, feedback's a good thing, especially when they tell you things you don't want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, also getting feedback from people who aren't into fingerboarding and, like, people who, like, are outside of the scene because they may say, like, oh, yeah, this really isn't good for beginners, but you have someone who's very experienced mm -hmm. and this is a perfect product. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting take on it, too, for sure. Yeah, sometimes you can learn the most also from people who know nothing about the thing you're doing, like because of the questions that they ask, because they're so different than the questions you would think of. How about guitar playing? You want to talk about when you got into guitar and stuff like that? Yeah. I. It was right around the time that I started fingerboarding. I think it was like sixth or seventh grade. So I was what, 12, 12 or so years old, 13 yeah. years old. My aunt had a classical guitar that was like warped and bent and um, that was the guitar that was at home and my parents were like you want to learn how to play guitar we have a guitar why don't you use that one and I tried learning on it and it was not fun to use at all you know it was not in good condition and my parents didn't know better so they were like she barely used it your aunt barely used it the yeah. guitar should be fine but it was barely used but it was like constantly changing with the climate and it was getting banged around. So um, I ended up not playing guitar again until I saved up my money and bought an electric guitar um, in high school. So I think it was maybe two or three years between when I first started learning, trying to learn how to play guitar and actually starting to learn. But um, yeah, guitar is still, a part of my life. I think it's like a small part of my life. Um, I never wanted to be a musician in a band. I always just wanted to express myself and like play for people like privately or for myself or just create videos. But, um, you know, I think guitar, guitar playing is like one of those hobbies too that nowadays I reflect on and as I get older and I have more commitments, guitar playing has kind of moved to the side a little bit and fingerboarding at some points in my life has moved to the side a bit. And I think it takes a level of maturity to say, you know what? I don't really have that much time for this hobby right now, but it's brought me a lot of joy in my life to this point and I'm okay with that. And there might be a point in my life where I start to get into it again and more and uh, that's a big personality thing of, of mine too I, I've always had a lot of hobbies and uh, I'll try and list them I guess it's like the the photography and film fingerboarding uh, billiards skateboarding guitar um, fingerboarding I was into fashion a lot um, cool I didn't know that yeah, I, I'm sure like I'm forgetting other things, <laughs> but like I've always tried to like learn a whole bunch of different hobbies and I got upset at myself because I would like try to do every single hobby every <laughs> single day or every week. And if I didn't do it, I would get angry at myself and I'm like, you're not making time for it. You're getting worse. You're losing the skill that you worked so hard to accumulate over the course of your life. And I've only recently been like, you know what, you can't do everything. And like, yeah. it's fine to like, just accept that's where it is. So I'll take it back to guitar because you asked about guitar. I still play guitar and I've gotten into classical guitar lately. Granted, I've been practicing two pieces by Francisco Tarrega for like half a year now. And I haven't learned any other pieces. But there's just something nice about perfecting and improving those pieces. And I don't 
ever think I'm going to perform this piece in like a concert venue. You're going to perform it right now for thousands of people. Yeah. Let's go. You yeah. want to play 30 seconds? I'll play some of it. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it? Bring it out. Bring out the guitar. But um, Gary's first concert. No, haven't you uploaded clips before? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Thought I remembered seeing some um, from a long time ago. But, but like I said, I think guitar has brought me joy. And there have been periods where like, I have not touched the guitar for months. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I feel like playing guitar. And like, yeah, that's fine. It's fine to, to do that. Oh gosh. This isn't live, right? So no, okay. if, if you mess up, we can start over. It's funny, if I close my eyes or I don't look, I'll like play it better. <laughs> the whole thing when I perfect it and well not when I perfect it because we already talked about this <laughs> when when it's good enough when it's good enough <laughs> I will upload more clips of it oh that'll be awesome yeah but yeah I haven't touched the guitar before today like probably for I don't know like two weeks or so and maybe that was just for 10 minutes to practice that piece so I'm at this point in my life where I'm like yeah picking up the guitar once in a while, playing that piece and like finding new ways to like improve the performance just like makes me happy and I'm, I'm happy enough that I'm at that point. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Were you playing billiards professionally for a bit? No, so or... I, um, I've played as, I don't even know, like, I talked about like the definitions of being a professional fingerboarder being right. different and for pool it's also similar, right? Um, you can be a professional pool player and those lines are kind of blurry. But So you were a bro. <laughs> Just say it. I was no. a high level <laughs> amateur, I'll say that. Cool. Right. Um, you were really good from what I could tell. Actually we played in my parents' basement, right? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Um, I've done trick shots with, with pool and fingerboarding before. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. I really enjoy um, playing pool at a high level because it's like, it's like chess, right? It's like chess, but in chess, the moves are, there are a limited number of moves, right? And a piece can only move a certain way and you can't 
execute that move differently than someone else, right? Yeah. So, for example, you know, a rook can only move, like, to the square. It's not like you can move it to a certain section of the square or, like, move it more slowly or quickly. Yeah. Whereas with pool, there's execution, there's planning. And um, I played in leagues, and now I don't play in leagues anymore. Um, I've played in tournaments before. Um, I don't like tournaments because there's a lot of sitting around between matches and with all the hobbies and interests that I have, I'd rather be doing something over sitting around. But um, there was a point where I got third place in the Indiana State Eight Ball Championship. It was a team event, but that was a, a fun, fun event. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember when I learned that it's not just about like getting the ball in that you're trying to get, but you're also thinking about like, you know, where's the cue ball going to end up if I do this versus I do that? And then like, where's that going to either set me or set the next person if I fail and stuff like that? Like that was all new to me because I had just played it for fun. Like I learned from my dad and I would play it once in a while and play with friends sometimes, but not too seriously. And then once I learned that, I can see how you related to chess in that way, where it's like there's more calculating than it initially seems. Because most people, like when they're not playing on a high level, I feel like it's just like, am I going to get this shot? Yes or no. And that's all that you're thinking of. There's no, there's no deeper thought to it than that at first. Yeah. So I'm going to relate it to fingerboarding in a little bit, but there are so many different layers and levels to pool that are related to fingerboarding. So level one is just learning how to strike the cue ball and make the object ball is what we call it. So let's say you're shooting at the one ball to go into the corner pocket. Once you learn how to do that, that's level one, right? The next level is what you mentioned, cue ball control. So it's how do I make the cue ball come back? How do I make the cue ball stop? How do I make it go forward? How do I make it bounce off of a cushion so it can land in a different spot so I can set myself up for the next ball. The next level is planning the rack, or planning three shots ahead is what we like to say. Where do I put myself on this ball so I can get into the position on the next ball to get on the third shot? Wow. So you always want to plan three shots ahead in pool. And when I say planning the entire rack, sometimes let's say the eight ball, let's say you're playing eight ball. There are many different games, but eight ball is the most common. Let's say the eight ball is in a tricky position or it's in a cluster where you can't make it in a pocket. You don't want to make all your balls and make it easier for your opponent where there's less stuff in the way and not have a shot on the eight. So you want to think, working backwards, where do I want to be on the eight so I can win the game? What ball is going to be the best ball to set me up to get on the eight, which is the last shot? So you backwards plan, and you want to think about, okay, three shots ahead. Where do I want to be on this ball to be on this ball to get on the last the yeah. third point? So that's like the third level. Then there's another layer, which is table conditions. So right now it's raining outside. You probably can't hear this, that it's raining because the mics are great. But the humidity in the room affects the bounciness of the cushions the cloth speed changes depending on how new or worn in it is. Um, the, the pocket size affects how gently or hard you can hit a ball. Um, the, um, the type of cue that you're using affects the strike and the amount of spin and um, how the cue ball is gonna react when you hit it. So how I relate it to fingerboarding is people don't realize that when you're fingerboarding, it's more than just you know how to do a kickflip. You have to adjust for all these different things. What surface am I riding on? What are there's there's two contact points, right? In fingerboarding, there's the wheels and then there's a the surface that you're riding on. And there's also if you're going to do a grind, you also have your trucks and the surface that you're going to grind on. You need to be aware of those you need to be aware of those surfaces and how they're going to react because if there's a surface that's grippier you're going to have to adjust your approach and a lot of people don't think yeah. about this but it's that's the reality right 
the table height. When the table's higher, it's easier to do nollie and switch tricks because it's easier to pop like that. But when it's down low like this, it's really awkward to like mm -hmm. do a nollie or switch trick. So that's something that you want to think about. Do I bend my knee so I can like get lower and like pop this trick more easily? So um, I think this kind of analytical approach and like thinking about like how does pool relate to fingerboarding like <laughs> definitely helps, you know? Yeah, that's cool. I was also thinking like your fingerboard setup, if you have more than one and you switch between them and they're, you know, not the exact same as each other, which they probably are not, then that's another thing to consider. It's almost like going to change. Well, it, it totally does change the way you have to fingerboard. Like if you have one board that's really worn in and maybe the trucks are looser and the wheels are less grippy and then you have one that's brand new and has grippy wheels and tight trucks and you have to fingerboard completely different on both of those. So you have to become aware of like what those different motions and amounts of pressure are and all that stuff. I have always ever used one fingerboard at a time. That's the best. I, That's the way I tell people if you want to really get good at fingerboarding, stop changing your board. Yeah. People are always looking for the quick fix and the solution. And just because a fingerboard might perform better doesn't mean that it'll work better for you, at least in that moment. It, take, it takes me maybe a week of consistently fingerboarding to get used to a new board. And that's minimum. I would say it, it takes me months to actually get very used to any change on a board. I like to keep everything the same and use the same board for years and years if there's nothing wrong with it. And the reason why I do that is because fingerboarding is not like pool in this regard. Pool is muscle memory, but you have time to think about things, right? With fingerboarding, this board is flipping at like hundredths of a second. And you need to put your fingers back on that board to catch it. And sometimes you're doing it into grinds or manuals or whatever it might be. And then you're doing another flip out and it's flipping hundreds of a second and you need to catch it and roll away. If you're constantly changing your setup and you're, you're not used to how fast it flips or how slow it flips, the rotation, the weight, etc., that can mean the difference between you landing or not landing that trick. And uh, if you're constantly changing your equipment, you're never going to get used to it. So the fingerboard should be like an extension of your your body, your fingers, or whatever. And you should go in with 100% confidence that, like, I know my board. I know my setup. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can give a tip to people out there, don't use your favorite fingerboard outside because you, you need <laughs> to have an outdoor setup because outdoor fingerboarding is going to damage your gear, your, your fingerboard, and then you're going to have to replace it. And unless you have an exact replacement, I wouldn't recommend it. So um, I've learned that the hard way. Yeah, that's true. Because even just dropping it a couple of times on pavement or something, like, is enough to chip it in a way that changes the pop or dent it. Or, like, boards will get kind of, like, soggy on the nose or tail, like, when that happens. And wheels and stuff, too. I feel like wheels are more replaceable because they are kind of, like, standardized. But you're never going to get the exact, exact same deck. So... Yeah, like what I do when I get used to a setup over like weeks and months, how you said, like I can get used to a setup in five minutes to a degree where it's like I'm comfortable, I can land pretty well with it like easily, but there's a much deeper level that comes with those weeks and months of using a setup, which is why a lot of times I do have the same board for like half a year or a few years or depending how much I like the board determines if I'm going to keep using it that long. But at that point I find like I know that if, let's say I'm doing a line and I land the first trick and my fingers are like not where I want them to be, that I can still land the next trick because I know how to do a nollie flip from the wrong position because I know the board that well. And it's like, you have to do a thousand nollie flips from the wrong position before you figure out how to land it from all of those. So it's like, and then if you change the board and you're in that wrong position, it's not going to do what your other board did. It's going to go somewhere else. So that's that's another like there's definitely layers to how, how much you can get used to a board and what you can like really learn about that setup. 
that's going to be pretty much unique to each setup. Yeah, like if you're at home and you're filming and you change something and you have time on your hands to be able to get used to that board, that's fine. But if I were going into like a rendezvous or like a contest or like someone's going to be filming me and I don't want like to take up all their time, yeah. like, I'm going to use the board that I'm most comfortable with and the one that I'm used to. Um, when I was preparing for Fast Fingers, I had a list of tricks that I knew I could go to if I needed to pull out like a trick. And those tricks might be tech tricks, but I practiced them enough that I had them down pretty consistently on different obstacles. So I'd do different obstacles and let's say it was like a, a tray flip uh, backside board slide. So it's pretty... Um, pretty basic but like to pull that out in a line or a contest like you're still doing a lot and with the board that I'm used to I may have landed that like 25 times out of 30 or something like that's pretty consistent there's no way I would do that with a new board just no way. yeah you don't make sudden changes before before anything that matters grip wheels deck anything yeah, yeah. and then if you want to like if you're trying to really become better at fingerboarding and that's your goal, then it's like every day matters. Every day is the contest, even though it's not literally, but it's like, do you want to be fingerboarding at your best every day or do you want to take a step back and set up a new board or change the grip or whatever it is? Yeah. Like sometimes when my board gets like holes in the grip or the grip is like so small around the edges, it's all worn down. I still use it like until it's bad, like performance wise, not looks wise. Cause I'm like, well, it's still performing how I'm used to. Like, I'm used to it. I got used to it getting all these holes and adapting as the holes came. And it's just like, you never want to change the grip. I know some people change the grip all the time, but I yeah. can't do it. I'm like, I want it super worn in and then I'm going to use it until it's like too small to use and then I'll change it. Or I'll even cut the tail off, like the tape, the tail, and I'll put like a new piece there and keep the rest because it's all worn in. Yeah. Because I always get a tail hole from back tails first. <laughs> You know, I really like something that you said, um, and I kind of assumed that incorrectly. Um, you said, if you want to be the best fingerboarder you can be, and every day is the contest, right? And that's very much me. Like, I always wanted to be the best fingerboarder I could be, and I wanted to push the limits. And I have spent hours trying to film a single trick for a video. And... Um, it was always with the fingerboard I was most familiar with. But that's not everybody's goal, right? Yeah. Some people's goals are, I want to have a large collection of fingerboards. Some people's goals are, like, I want to try new products and just have different boards to get used to and enjoy riding, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I've never been that. Um, I've never been a collector. I've never been, like, someone who wanted to have a whole bunch of different boards. I was more of, like, a like a technician, like, yeah, I want to be the best I could be, film the hardest tricks possible, be as consistent as possible, and just stick to what I'm used to using. Yeah, that's a good perspective. There's definitely a lot of different types of, like, approaches there. Because I'm, like, not really a collector, but I have a crazy collection. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. I almost value my setup more than the entire collection when I have a good setup. It's just, like, this is the one. The other stuff's for fun, and it's on the side and I'll use it here and there, but, like, if I'm about to film or, like, fingerboard with somebody, I'm probably going to pick out, like, my main setup that I've been using for a long time, and that's going to be the one. Yeah, and I think, also, um, quality controls come a long way, and I think you probably have setups that are set up pretty close to identical to each other, you know, or, like, yeah. ones that you know will perform similarly. That's true. Whereas, like, back in the day, like, even, like, the, the only two boards you could pick up that were going to be completely the same were probably tech decks, you know? <laughs> but even then, you might have one that's more worn in than the other, and it doesn't work the same. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, do you have any other things you want to talk about before we get to the questions people submitted? Um, Anything I didn't ask about? No, let's, let's go into the cool. submitted questions and see... Yeah, see where it takes us. Let's do it. Yeah, they may ask about something that I wanted to ramble about. Tell them thanks for teaching me lasers. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, I don't even remember doing the laser flip 
tutorial. So <laughs> you're very welcome. That's awesome. Why have you used the same setup since 2000? <laughs> well, to correct the record, Mike, I don't remember when you gave me this board. Pretty recently, a couple of years maybe? Yeah. This is a recent setup for my standards. So I, what is your setup? It is... You probably know better than me. This is well, this yeah. is this is how much of a technician I am and not a collector. So I've got uh, Black River trucks. It's thirty-two millimeters wide. Yep. Um, I would say this is like medium to tight trucks. It's just a blank deck, no graphic. I've got fingerboard store, extra smooth tape, um, and I don't know what wheels these are. They're the tan flat face wheels. And, five and the board is the G15.12. Awesome. It's low concave. Yep. Low concave and um, is it like medium kicks? Yeah. Yeah. So I personally like low concave because my fingers are pretty flat when I ride. I don't like curl my fingers much. So um, with high concave boards, I find the board flips too much and like my fingers don't actually like um, mold to the concave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've I have used boards for a long time. Um, <laughs> since two thousand. Oh yeah, I wasn't even fingerboarding in two thousand. <laughs> but yeah, I stick to one thing and uh I try to I try to let that be the tool that I really know well. Yeah, that's so, good. Yeah. How does it feel to be a crucial part of so many people's early experiences learning how to fingerboard? My only response to that is thank you, and it feels like a tremendous... Um, I'm like tremendously honored to have been such like a critical part of people's like learning in fingerboarding you know when I created those videos there's no way I could have ever imagined like I'm gonna help I don't even know what to put a number on like thousands let's just say thousands of people it could be millions because you had over what a couple million views on one of them yeah I so think, I think all my trick tips in total probably had like eight to ten million views or something like that that's all, crazy all so even if sometimes the person didn't walk away having learned something and most of the time they did you can still say you've taught millions of people how to do tricks yeah well let's I just say millions of views on yeah, these trick tips that's amazing i'm tremendously like honored to to have done that and like that's what keeps me loving fingerboarding because um, it's not like skateboarding where I was like forced to stop because like my body was breaking down, right? Because skateboarding is hard on the body. For fingerboarding, it was more, I'm kind of tired of like sitting at my desk and like filming for hours to like just do tricks and put them in a video. I got a little burnt out on that. But like one thing that has always stuck with me is like teaching people how to do tricks people telling me that they were able to learn from me and that like they watched my videos when they were a kid and like there are some people who are like in their 20s now and they're like when I was a child I watched your videos and that's like <laughs> so amazing to hear that yeah and like I love going out to events and hearing people um, say that they learned from me so thank you yeah that's amazing do you love kickflips do I love kickflips <laughs> Everybody loves kickflips, not just me. <laughs> cool, there's a lot of comments like this. Fingerboard legend, he was probably the first 360 flip tutorial on YouTube. I probably started watching him before I started watching you, such a trip. You got a lot of fans. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the lowest kickflip challenge? Oh, yes. <laughs> and I think you... It managed to do a kickflip that was like essentially a barrel roll. Yeah, like on with the no table. pop, right? Yeah. <laughs> you you didn't even pop the board. Like yeah. well, it was weird. It it wasn't like you just rolled the board back. I think the tail never hit the desk that you're fingerboarding on. I think what happened was you used the momentum to kind of just slide your finger and it yeah. just like rolled on the table. If you start popping and then you just flick really fast, you can 
flip it before the pop actually happens and it just kind of like floats a little bit yeah. and just barely makes it it's similar to how you like kick flip out of a board slide on a rail or something like there's no pop it's all in the flick and like just the timing <laughs> yeah i do remember the lowest kick flip challenge i did it i think i filmed it on a webcam and <laughs> it was in a dark room and i did it on a tech deck and the video on youtube was like two seconds long of just me doing a low kick flip <laughs> and i said can you do a low kick flip like reply to the YouTube video because at the time I think you could reply do video replies and uh, yeah I think there were a, a couple of entertaining um, submissions I think yours was like laughably low I could not believe how low it was but that's funny like nowadays it's kind of unacceptable to put up a two second video on YouTube but like it, bring it back yeah in those days you know yeah it's awesome You got a lot of these. How does it feel knowing you're part of fingerboard history? Everybody loves kickflips. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, well, we basically covered this one, actually. How has fingerboarding influenced your job as a teacher? But is there any additional, anything to add to that? or? Yeah. Um, I'm going to not talk about what I'm currently doing. I'm going to talk about, like, the specific sector of nonprofit work that I'm in. Um, I was teaching for two years and then I went into after school programs for four years and um, we like to call those out of school time programs and I like that more than teaching in a school because kids would come to the after school program and they would have like recess and snack and like there was less pressure than school. School was like, oh, you need to study for this test. Here's your homework. And after school was a little bit of a break from that. Um, and I've continued to kind of run programs that work with youth after school. Um, right now it's with bicycles and bike mechanics. Oh, that was a hobby that I forgot, I think. It was riding my bike inside. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. But that's literally my career is... Um, designing programs for youth to fix up bicycles and keep that at the end of the program. And um, I would describe the work that I'm interested in as um, social, impact, social impact nonprofits that work with youth around youth development, youth empowerment, um, and youth engagement. And that's particularly with youth who come from like marginalized backgrounds or had like challenging or adverse childhoods um, who are looking for connection and joy. Um, so you ask how fingerboarding has contributed to that career and I reflect on myself as a teenager who, as I talked about, I struggled a little bit in high school like forming genuine connections and I was able to find genuine connections through fingerboarding. And that's an after-school activity, right? I remember one of my high school projects was on fingerboarding. You know, I, I found ways to incorporate fingerboarding into my life, and I'm still that way. I think um, my purpose is to help youth find themselves and experience joy and recognize like, the things in their life that make them happy and fingerboarding, pool, you know, like all of those things could be possible hobbies that they mm -hmm. could take up. And uh, that's, that's definitely how I relate nowadays. I'm not like teaching kids how to fingerboard in person, but I always think back on like, yeah, I've made a difference in kids' lives. And that's because fingerboarding helped me. Yeah. It's very simple. That's so cool. I feel like... I don't know exactly how to say it, but I feel like you're this, like, figure that helps people. Like, I feel like that's, like, your character or something. There's something within you where it's, like, wherever you go or whatever you do, even if you change what that is later, it's, like, going to have that theme somehow. It's, like, what you do is, like, bringing, I don't know, it's bringing, like, direction and influence to the next generation somewhere. And it's it's really cool. Is there any, like, deeper 
deeper thing in your psychology, let's say, that like makes you that person, makes makes that the way that you approach, whether it's your career or your hobbies or anything? I don't know. Um, maybe there's maybe there's someone who's like has a degree in psychology and can like <laughs> analyze this my responses, right? But I think a lot of it has to do with my upbringing, you know, with my family. We really didn't like grow up with much. We had like our bicycles and like we rode bikes on family vacations and we like made sure that we all sat at the dinner table together. You know, my family was always together. Um, we all lived in the same household. Um, and they were always supportive of my fingerboarding, you know, aside from like a question here and there that was like, you know, this makes a lot of noise. Like what, uh, is this going to help you? <laughs> but like, I was able to respond to that in a positive way and they were supportive of it. Mm -hmm. And even my elderly grandparents never like put me down for it and that's awesome I think them giving me that positive feedback and allowing me to like branch out and explore like wow like I'm helping people through fingerboarding like that gave me a sense of purpose mm -hmm. and maybe over time that's like altered my brain chemistry in a way that like yeah like I helped people I want to continue helping people um, I think there's nothing more empowering for like a teenager to be able to like teach other teenagers or not even that. I think now that I think about it as a teenager, I was putting out trick tips and people older than me were saying like, <laughs> I've watched like hundreds of trick tips and this one helped me. So like that got me out of the mindset of like when I get older I can like make a difference it was right now I'm making a difference and maybe that's that's who I am now um, I might not be the most technical fingerboarder um, in the world but I can at least communicate like what fingerboarding has brought me and how to perform tricks so that they can get to where they want to go yeah that's incredible mm. I love it it's amazing. <laughs> it really is. Please tell me, does practice really make perfect? Practice Practice makes better. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. Practice makes better and targeted practice makes for the best version of who you can be. And um, <coughs> this goes with all things in life, right? If you are a complete beginner and you're trying to learn how to ollie and you're trying to like learn how to ollie over for people who are just listening to the audio if you're just saying I want to ollie over this mason jar filled with water filled with water now you're gonna have to do it for the people watching yeah oh <laughs> it almost went in there, there you go, go. <laughs> <laughs> But if you're a complete beginner, <laughs> if you're a complete beginner and you set that as your practice goal and your target, but you don't make adaptations to how you're approaching it, you're going to get better, but at a slower rate, right? I think if, this is for the people that are actually watching too, like if I were to roll off the edge of this table and go upside down and go over the mason jar slowly like that and try to land the board, that is one way that I can adapt, right? Um, another thing that you can do is maybe put it on your leg and like go upside down and try and go over the jar or like use a smaller obstacle or try to go on top of something instead of over something. Yeah, right. taking the steps before completing the whole thing. Right. And if you're targeted with your practice, you're going to make improvements faster. And in the areas that you struggle with, rather than um, rather than just like a blanket approach, right? That's um, great. Yeah, it's like a more intricate approach. Yeah. 
and, and also there's working on your strengths and there's working on your weaknesses, right? I know, for example, um, a go-to trick for me is tray flips, um, kick flips, and I'm stronger with like switch backside flips and switch tray flips, right? A weaker trick for me would be like switch frontside flips instead of switch backside flips. I could avoid switch, switch frontside flips for the rest of my life and <laughs> never improve in them and just work on the things I'm good at. That will seek improvement, right? I will improve in my consistency and what I'm already strong at. Mm -hmm. But by ignoring the weaknesses, you also are not going to be as well-rounded. So it's a balance. Work on your strengths and lean on those strengths, but also work on those weaknesses so that when they come up, you're going to at least be able to perform those tricks. Yeah. yeah. How to kickflip on a fingerboard. <laughs> yeah. They want me to do a trick tip right now. <laughs> yeah. Watch the old video. I taught it better, I think, as a teenager. Yeah, we'll put a link to it. Yeah. What's it like being the nicest guy in fingerboarding? Also, any pool tips? The nicest guy in fingerboarding? I guess so. Wow. Well, what a compliment. Um... Thank you. Um, any pool tips? Well, I want to know where they are in their pool journey, I guess. You know, if they're a complete beginner, I would say focus on the motions of playing pool. You know what? This actually could apply to anybody who's playing pool. Um, if you remove the table and the balls that are on the table and the cue stick, you have like fundamentals that like you can work on in playing pool so there's a bridge hand which is where the cue rests on when you're playing so this is an open bridge and this is a closed bridge where there's a loop and the stick can actually go through here um, and then there's also your stance and the way that you hold the stick so you want your back arm and your elbow to be at about 90 degrees and you want it to hang loosely by your side if you're holding it you know too far up or too far back then you're going to be you know, in a compromised position, right? So I'm not saying that you need to work on your stance and the way that you're following through and all that, but there are so many different components and I would say break it down piece by piece, right? People are like, I want to shoot this ball into that ball so I can make it in the pocket. You could just shoot the ball into the pocket without shooting it into another ball and practice that first. And then before you do that, you can practice putting your hand on the table and just following through without hitting a ball at all. And then you can remove the table and just like practice like putting your hand on the table and like making sure that you are uh, secure in your, in your foundations and your fundamentals. So that's my full tip. Um, break it down step by step. Cool. Yeah. I like that. It's a really cool approach too, and it's similar to how you do the fingerboarding ones. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people, I, I don't know, I even want to say I've never seen anyone approach things like that, or not very common anyways. Like, yeah. I feel like people always look at the big general thing they want to do, and then they just like jump in and try to do that thing. Yeah. You know, if it's a, a trick you see, it's like, okay, I'm just gonna do the trick and try to do the trick. And it's not like, well, what are the parts of it that it's made out of? And sometimes I think I learned certain tricks more similar to your way, where like, let's say it's like a frontside big spin heel, and it, let's say it wasn't working or whatever, but then I notice like, oh, it's just varial heel revert, and then gradually get less revert and more 180. And like, once you break it into even just two sections like that, like, oh, it's a trick I can do, and it's another trick I can do, and throw it together into one, so yeah, I guess that's that's kind of similar to that. Yeah, this is for the the general um, listeners or, or viewers. If you were to apply it to fingerboarding, I think the single greatest tip for ollies or the the part that people struggle with is they want to learn how to pop the board. They can't get the board in the air, right? Mm. So you know, you telling someone like pop the board, that's so abstract to them. Yeah. I always tell people, put your fingers on the tail or your back finger on the tail and you want to flick your hand like this, right? And 
I just tell people, don't even use the fingerboard and do this. Mm-hmm. And like my forearm is feeling it right now. <laughs> and I have years of fingerboard experience, right? For someone who doesn't fingerboard, for them to do that, like yeah, you have to build up that coordination. And there's a reason why switch is more difficult because like doing this with your index finger is way harder, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Oh yeah, it is way harder. What the heck? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So break it down step by step and like do this to learn how to pop the board. And now all you have to do is, you know, I'm not even gonna put my fingers on the board. I'm just gonna have it floating. And I'm gonna do that same motion. And the board pops, right? So now that you can get the board in the air, you move your hand forward and up so that you can ollie. So it's like, right? So that's, that's my suggestion. Just break it down step by step and like remove the board, remove the obstacles. You see people all the time when they're like preparing for a trick in a video. It looks kind of silly, but like, let's say they're doing like a kickflip. They'll like do this. And they're like visualizing what it's like oh, yeah, to yeah. kickflip. Same thing. Like right now, I don't have a board, but like I'm visualizing kickflip, you know? And like I want to roll away here. So I'm going to put my fingers here and actually roll away. This is the spot that I want to land. So I'm going to practice putting my fingers right there and rolling away. So now that I have a board, I can piece it together. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Do you still love kickflips? I love kickflips. Over the years, I have tried to move away from kickflips and be like, Gary, you need to like not have kickflips be like your go-to trick. But <laughs> the reality is kickflip, kickflips are an, a go-to trick for everybody. Yeah, I don't, totally. Like, I don't know. There are people who are like, I like heel flips more than kickflips. But th those are the outliers, right? You yeah. know those people. They're doing it just because they don't want to love kickflips. Deep down, you know they love them. Right? <laughs> That's perfect, because the next question is, am I the only one who doesn't like kickflips? <laughs> I think you need to really just admit it for yourself. <laughs> and <laughs> you know what? It's actually cool if, if you don't love kickflips. Yeah, no, I know this guy. He's actually, like, he does a lot of different tricks that aren't kickflips. Yeah. Um, you know, kickflips are very common and for a reason, you know, I, I do think that, um, kickflips are like the foundation for a lot of tricks. And I said mm -hmm. that in the trick tip, but, um, it can get overused, but it's a simple trick that everybody knows and is like fascinated by and you can perform it in different ways on different obstacles even people who don't like skateboard or fingerboard they have like that meme where it's like do a kick flip, yeah right? like <laughs> everyone knows what they are yeah yeah <laughs> yeah do you think you could redo your trick tutorials yeah um i think now that as a teenager when i was creating the trick tips i was kind of just like going off the cuff Right. I think nowadays I could explain things um, in a clearer way and I could use the videos to like illustrate finger positionings better. And that's something that I actually wanted to do maybe a decade ago was like create like a DVD or like a full length of like all the tricks that you could do on a fingerboard. But it almost felt like recreating things that were already out there. So mm -hmm. I'm going to throw a question back out to the audience and you can uh, let me know what the response is. I wanted to create like a series of like beyond just the trick fingerboarding tips. So I talked about like body positioning and like surfaces and like how high or low the desk is and like modifying your equipment. Like I think these are things that aren't talked about in fingerboarding. Yeah, and, I like, think I think there's a there's an appetite that you should do that because people sometimes ask me those questions and sometimes I know the answer and sometimes I really have to think about it because it's just something I do naturally and then when I think about it I'm like oh yeah 
I do stand over to the left when I'm trying this trick and I never like consciously noted it. It's just something that I do. So I think talking about those kinds of things, that would be really cool. Yeah. I think you should do it. I'll let you know what other people say too. Sure. I mean, I, I definitely want to recreate the trick tips, um, but this can be a bonus um, because there's psychology involved in fingerboarding too. Yeah, it's like, true. Everybody has practiced a trick for hours and hours and then they walk away and they come back to it the next day and they have a new approach and they land it quickly. And that's because like you have a different mindset, you have a different outlook, the conditions are different. Yeah. Totally. This dude said, why did you unfollow him, Mike? You got beef. And I saw this earlier and I checked if I was following you and I was. So I was like, I don't even know what he's talking about. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I don't maybe pay he attention. Was, maybe he's concerned that um, I was getting more followers than him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, just kidding. Yeah, who knows? Oh, cool. Best moment in your life. Best moment in my life. Um, getting married cool yeah. I had a feeling you were going to say that yeah that's uh, awesome yeah I'll just leave it at that cool awesome how many miles per week do you log cycling and what's your <laughs> average pace oh boy um, how many miles do I log per week so recently I've averaged about 250 miles a week. Whoa. I have done anywhere from 15 to 20 hours per week. Um, and that's on top of full-time work. Um, I commute Whoa. I commute to and from work. Um, it's about 12 miles each way. Um, Crazy. But the days that I don't commute in, um, I either ride my road bike um, outside or I have it set up on an indoor trainer where I do like interval workouts and I have spent um, hours on an indoor bike too. It's, I don't know, I have like this, I don't know, maybe it's just like I enjoy seeing how deep I can like punish myself like <laughs> physically. Um, I've That's been, amazing. I've been on the indoor bike for over six <coughs> hours before. And like at once, what's dripping six hours? And, yeah, wow. Um, and I think that ride, I burn like five thousand calories. I like have meals in front of me while I'm like <laughs> riding my bike. I have. Been, Do you eat during it or just after? During, yeah. Okay. You, you have to yeah. fuel the workout. Yeah, I was gonna say, how do you? Even before you said that thing about five thousand calories, I'm like, how do you get enough fuel in your body to handle that? Yeah, before a ride. A really big ride I try to make sure I have like carbohydrates because that's what keeps you going and I try to aim for like 20 to 40 grams of carbohydrates per hour which is like on the low side um, for someone who's like not well I'm not racing if I was racing I would try to get like 80 grams of carbs an hour which is like wow like, whoa, a lot. yeah what would you eat to do that like do you eat healthy carbs or donuts or you can do um, sweet potato you can do all of those things honestly um, I think when you're exercising, like endurance exercise, not like weightlifting, right? Um, that is the time to be able to like take in those carbohydrates that like can digest quickly. Mm -hmm. So like some pro cyclists have taken like gummy bears before. They'll like eat gummy bears. <laughs> but um, in terms of what like professional athletes take in, they usually have like sports drink mix, which is like carbohydrate mix. And that's like Gatorade times ten or whatever right it's like almost sludgy in their oh. water bottle and that one water bottle might be like 80 grams of carbohydrates and on top of that they're taking in like gels which are like um it's almost like sugar right and um like um nutrition bars you know cliff bars or whatever um i like to eat fig bars or like whole foods but an example of what I might do for like a four hour ride is like, I'll have two bananas or something. I'll have like two packages of fig bars. I'll have gel and then I'll have like Gatorade or like electrolyte mix inside my water bottles. But yeah, for those long rides, it's, I'm burning about an average of 700 calories an hour. This is wow. the pace that I go. Um, and the next question was, 
how fast do I typically go on the bike? Um, it varies a lot. I think there are a lot of people who are like, I want to train and be like a road racer. So like they go fast, right? I have gone 20 miles an hour on average for long rides before on a road bike, which is considered very fast if you're going solo, right? But I've had times where like I will literally go like eight miles an hour because I'm like enjoying like the scenery and just like going slowly and there's pedestrians walking along the river or like I'm grocery shopping. I've like grocery shopped um, with like my bags full of stuff from the store. Yeah. And, like, I'm not trying to go fast then. And, you know, the bike's <laughs> so heavy. So yeah, it varies. Um, this year I'm trying to do 10,000 miles on my bike wow. annually. I'm at about 6,200, so I'm, oh, you got I'm it. above. We're only halfway through the year. Yeah. You got it. But I know that November and December are going to be slow, mm. slow months. True. And I'm traveling a little bit because I have some friends who are getting married. And, like, it's not realistic for me to, like, travel and, like, bring a bike or, like, do yeah. a long ride. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're, like, probably super healthy in order to be able to handle doing that. Yeah. Um ironically the way that I could be healthier is if I rode less and I slept more <laughs> because I think I over ride okay um, then but, why do you over if you think you're overdoing it why do you overdo it yeah, cause why I, do you continue to because I enjoy it and it's a part of my routine yeah um, and also like I set this goal for myself which really doesn't matter but like once I achieve that goal I'm gonna like probably dial it back a bit mm -hmm. um without getting into too much detail, I think like I'm entering the messy middle of like my thirties. Right. And I think this is the year where I could do like a lot of miles and like, just like do that, like hit 10,000 miles. And like, I'm done with that goal for my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it averages out, I think to like 28 miles a day without skipping a day. Mm -hmm. There's some days where I do a hundred and there's some days where I do like 15 or 10 or five yeah I, I I think there's been one day this year where I like didn't ride at all so. wow <laughs> <laughs> it takes it takes kind of a, a crazy commitment you didn't bike here this time did you no okay no. <laughs> I didn't think so oh it's raining obviously it's raining do you ever go out in the rain like more um, casual or? I um I rode in the rain today um cool. we had a fundraising event um for the organization I work for Luckily, the rain held off in the morning, but on the way home, it rained. Mm. The worst weather to bike in is 40 degrees and raining. I would rather it just be snowing and be freezing. Really? Or it be warmer and raining. Because 40 and raining, if your clothes get wet, that you're like at risk for hypothermia. Mm. Right? Um, so you need to have like waterproof gear, but also like you get sweaty from the inside as well. Yeah. So it's like 40 degrees and rain is just like really tough wow and i don't ride in the rain unless it's for work or if i have to be somewhere and like the bike is my only option um otherwise i'll just ride indoors if it's for fitness so it depends on the purpose yeah yeah if i actually have to go somewhere there's like commuting and what, what would we say um utility if i'm riding for utility i'll go out in the rain if it's for like fitness or exercise I'd rather be dry yeah at home than like totally outside in the rain yeah dang that's just incredible like yeah wow riding outside bike commuting to work helps a lot and, yeah um I live in the Boston area so for me to drive into work it's 12 miles during peak traffic times that's like 50 minutes to an hour for me to take the train is about an hour and for me to bike door to door is about an hour so the way that I think about it is I would have been riding anyway so I might as well like ride to work ride home my wife and I share a car so it's like convenient I get my exercise we end up not having to like get another car and like I'm, I'm kind of like being healthy on myself and being environmentally sustainable. It's also like way more fun. I like get to ride along the river and like say hi to people and see like 
ducks and stuff like that on the side of the road instead of like being like in traffic it's not like a fun drive it's like you're literally stuck behind people yeah it's definitely a much nicer journey on a bike getting to interact and everything yeah very cool all right that's basically it we have one more what he does for work now and where he's been yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll give the quick the quick rundown because i think i spoke about it a little bit yeah. earlier so what i do now is i work for an organization called bikes not bombs in boston and i've been with that organization for a little over three years i'm their director of community engagement which means I develop partnerships with public schools and with other nonprofits and um, like for-profit organizations to advance our work, which is to use bicycles for social change. What that means in a nutshell is um, we take donated bikes every year. We take like 5,000 donated bicycles that people aren't using and we use them for different programs to teach kids bike mechanics to get bikes to people who need transportation, who can't afford a bike or can't afford a car. So um, we also ship bicycles internationally to partners in South and Central America and Africa. So we've shipped over 80,000 bicycles since we were formed in 1984. So um, it's basically like using these bikes in various areas to make a positive impact in people's lives. Um, And I, I love that work, I think. I get to work with the youth um, in those youth mechanics programs, but also be involved in like some fundraising and like some social media stuff. Um, I talked about how fingerboarding got me into film because it's kind of a small organization. I still use my like film and like video editing knowledge to create like content for our organization, social media, and stuff like that. We just created like a documentary um, highlighting one of our staff members. So that's really cool. Nice. Um, and then um, prior to that, I was the director of after school programs um, for four years, and then I was a teacher for two years. So I've always been in like the kind of youth empowerment space. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. And then we're in, when they said, where have you been? I'm sure they mean, like, where's the fingerboard footage, you know? Uh, they yeah. they want to see, it's like fingerboarders, if they're not putting out videos, it's just like, where are they? You know, like, people always ask that. Yeah. So why don't we go film a few tricks right now? Yeah, we'll film some tricks. <laughs> and um, I think in terms of where I've been, this this process of being on the podcast, like, thank you, Mike, for inviting me. Um, has like kind of reinvigorated me because I think I've been in the fingerboard scene for so long and like to me it's more than just about the tricks now yeah and totally like yeah I do want to film tricks but like I love talking to people and like being able to tell my story and like talk about the things in fingerboarding that other people might not have thought about so um, just through having this conversation I've thought about like what's next for me in fingerboarding and like i'm excited so cool um yeah you'll see more of me that's awesome yeah that's really good i'm happy to hear that and glad to have been a part of the reinvigoration Mm -hmm. process i mean it happens a lot to people like you kind of fade in and out of fingerboarding as you're doing other things and as you know, fingerboarding changes or where you are changes. And like, you know, sometimes all it takes is like one conversation or one like, oh, I decided to go on YouTube and I watched a video and it was so good I got excited again or or one event somebody goes to and then they're like, I think I want to get back into this or, you know, it's it's all these different possibilities. And I've been noticing a lot that people who fingerboard lately uh, who have been doing it for a long time and then kind of fade it out randomly people come back into it you know it's it's like whatever triggers you to get that spark again or a different spark it's all 
it's all like it's cool you know you don't have to do it all the time you don't have to fingerboard every day for 30 years straight you can fingerboard when you want to and when it feels right right if if this question was asked of me like i don't know 15 years ago i probably like seeing a video online seeing someone do a trick i probably would have said like wow that's an awesome trick i need to learn how to do this trick too so i can have it in my bag and like I am going to learn it, right? And that's what's going to inspire me, and I will film that trick. Nowadays, it's, I don't know if it's a more mature perspective, but it's like, wow, this person is amazing, and I want to kind of highlight, like, the fact that they can do this trick and, like, say, like, wow, that, that was awesome. And, like, just think about, like, what is the progression in fingerboarding and like look at all of these new people who are like pushing the limits of what's possible and like yeah yeah it's just it's a different it's a different perspective i think i'm like really happy to like see that it's going to continue to evolve it's insane where it's going like some of the combos people do now like they make me feel old or something like i'm just like oh i don't know if i could do that you know and it's really awesome just to see people like pushing the limits of what can be done yeah and hopefully trying to keep up a little bit but <laughs> well it's all in the you phone. you've always been active and i still think that you are like a pioneer in a lot of tricks too so um yeah thank you of course <laughs> all right let's let's film some yeah let's go do it cool well thank you so much for coming on the show this was really awesome yeah thanks for having me yeah cool Yeah. All right, back, tail it. Oh, yeah. Is that low enough? Nah, we could do lower than that. Okay. Oh, yeah. That was the lock-in. There it is.